Hi, I'm Zibby Owens, the creator and host of the award-winning podcast that you're listening to right now, thank you so much, called Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. It is a daily podcast, 365 days a year, and each day we talk to an author about all of the things related to their career, their book, their life, and more in 30 minutes or less, because who has time? I am now an author myself, although I wasn't when I started this podcast, and you can get my new memoir, Bookends, a memoir of love, loss, and literature, wherever books are sold starting July 1st, and my children's book, Princess Charming. You can learn more about me at zibbyowens.com, but really, you're here to learn more about the authors, and that is what we're going to do. Also, be sure to check out all the other podcasts in the Zcast Podcast Network. You can learn more at zcastnetwork.com. Dot com and definitely check out those shows as well. Alicia Fernandez Miranda is the author of My What If Year, a memoir. This is a particularly exciting episode because this is our very first Zibby book title to hit the shelves. For those of you who don't know, which might be impossible given how often I post about it, I started a publishing company called Zibby Books, and today marks our very first launch. So please join me in listening to this episode with Alicia, who by the way has guest hosted several of these episodes in the past, and make sure to go out and get your very first Zibby Books title now. Okay, Alicia, a respected authority on women's empowerment, social impact, and sustainability, Alicia Fernandez Miranda serves as chair and former CEO of IG Advisors, an award-winning social impact intelligence agency that consults with the world's biggest nonprofits, foundations, and corporations on their philanthropy and social initiatives. Her clients include the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, the Ford Foundation, and UN Women. A graduate of Harvard University and the London School of Economics, her writing has been featured in Vogue, Business Insider, Romper, Huffington Post, among others. At the beginning of 2020, Alicia paused her high-powered career to pursue a series of internships on Broadway with contemporary art dealer Blaine, fitness studio Retro Glow, and in the kitchen of the Kinlock Lodge. Alicia is the daughter of a Cuban immigrant and hails from Miami. She currently lives in Scotland with her husband and two children and suspects that her favorite job will always be the one she's planning to try next. Go out today and get your first Zibby Books book. Welcome, Alicia. Thank you so much for coming on Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books to discuss my What If Year, your memoir. I literally could not be more excited to be doing this right now with you. I am like beaming. (laughs) So my What If Year is the first book from Zibby Books coming out today when this airs on February 7th. It is so exciting. And as I reread this book to prepare for today, because I've read it in multiple iterations, but just, Mm -hmm. you know, the final whatever. I just am like, I love this book so much. I love this book with all my heart and soul. I could not be more excited that this is our first book. And you did such a good job. And I am just like over the moon excited. So that's, I just had to say that. I am so glad you still feel that way. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, yeah. (laughs) I feel like the opposite response. I was actually, I I really reread it like in full when I had to record my audiobook and I was worried. I was like, what if I don't like it anymore? But I was, I was, I was still happy with it. So (laughs) it's so good. It's so good. And I'm just so honored that we get to publish it. So thank you. Really, well, I am so honored to be on the guest side of this podcast with you. I, I feel like this is a real dream. Like honestly, like this is one of those things that was on like my life vision board. I can't really believe that it's happening. Well, not only are you on the other side, but you have been a guest host for what? How many episodes did you guest host? Ten or ten 12? brilliant episodes. And oh I my love, gosh! Well, I don't know if the episodes were brilliant, but they're my brilliant. They're you're, everything you do them. is brilliant. <laughs> I love them so so much. I had so much fun doing them. And of course, you host your own podcast, Quit Your Day Job, which is a Zibby Audio podcast. So you are like such a pro. I mean, you could just do this. I'll just sit here and like let you just talk. It's, you know. Just here with my (laughs) mic and my $8 headphones and I'm really (laughs) just, I love it. I love that this is my life now though, that I get to do this. Like how crazy is this and how different is it from what my life used to be, which certainly you'll see a lot when you read the book. Yes, I know. And knowing, knowing that you're here and where you started and all of this stuff. I mean, I'd love you to explain to listeners what my what if year is about, but in general, you have a quote in the book where you say, how long had it been since I had been happy? For so long, I thought the pursuit of happiness had been what was guiding me, but now I wasn't so sure. And you kept saying things like, it should have been the perfect time in my life, except it wasn't. So talk to me about 
this book and the project that led to the book. So it's weird and amazing to have your own words quoted back to you, as I'm sure you know from having written your memoir. I love it, I have to say. It's pretty great. But that, you know, I was writing there, that's uh, from the beginning of the book and about a time in my life, which was back in sort of 2019, where, you know, on paper, I kind of had all the things. I was approaching 40. I was CEO of my own business. I had healthy twins and a loving husband and a really cute dog with an Instagrammable face. And I had just all the things that I had been kind of working toward. And instead of feeling happy and content and satisfied, I felt this major itch. Like what if, as in the title of the book, what else, why am I not happy? And then of course, incredibly guilty that I had all of this and I still somehow was not satisfied with my life. And so I kind of hatched this idea that evolved over time, which was to go back and explore the uncharted career paths of my youth and to try to get unpaid internships at the jobs I always wanted to do when I was a kid. At that original time, it was thinking about things like musical theater and art and marine biology was on the short list back then. And so I actually managed to turn this project into a reality. And that is what my What If Year is about. It's my experience of going and taking four internships in these dream jobs. And by the way, during the first wave of the COVID pandemic was when all of this takes place. So that's generally what it is about. (laughs) So in the book, you referred yourself as sort of just another normal Cuban Jewish girl and how from the very beginning you have been this Per, not perfectionist, but someone who's striving for excellence at all times, starting with the fact that you started to read at an extremely early age in preschool. Start at the beginning and just explain a little bit about your background and sort of where this malaise may have come from. Mm. This, like, Because what happens when you set goals and keep reaching them? Like, then what? You have to find sort of what's underneath all of that. So exactly. take us back to the beginning for a second. So I am from Miami originally. My dad immigrated from Cuba in the 60s. My mom is a nice Jewish girl from North Miami Beach. And I grew up, you know, in like a very sort of, we lived in the suburbs, very close to the Everglades. I went to public school, but I was always, I had this drive to always be the best, do the best. Being smart, being good at school, that was like my thing. And, you know, I've had a lot of time to reflect on that, having written a whole (laughs) memoir about my life. Um, It's like free therapy, really. And, you know, I, I came from this family, like many, I think, kids who grew up with immigrant parents of, you know, education is the way forward. That is what we do. That is your single kind of responsibility in your life. You have to do well in school. You have to get a good education. And that was really ingrained in me from a very young age. But I was also very self-motivated. I loved the feeling of being the best. I loved getting A's. I loved achieving things. Like that was where I got my big serotonin, you know, bump from doing all of that. Endorphin, endorphin rush, serotonin, whatever the thing is. It makes you feel really good. That's what happened. So, you know, I I powered my way through school. I graduated high school. I said when I was nine years old that I wanted to go to Harvard. I don't even know how I heard about Harvard. I didn't know anybody that went to Harvard or I I I must have seen it in a movie or something like that. (laughs) But that was what I wanted to do. I did my undergraduate there. And then I kind of just, I got on the treadmill, right? I was like doing successively more kind of bigger jobs, bigger roles. I moved to the UK because I had a real love for travel and being abroad and and uh, a husband who's willing to come along with me. And, you know, so I was just, I just kept like unlocking the levels and like leveling up, leveling up. And then I got to this point where I really kind of had, had at, it was at the top of my game. Like I was doing all of the things that I was supposed to be doing. And it was very, very hard to get there and then somehow still think, wait, is this, is this it now? Is this just what I do forever? Like what, what more is out there and why am I so unsatisfied? Why do I keep feeling like I have to do more and more? And so this internship plan was like the way to solve that crisis. And it ended up bringing so much more into my life than I ever possibly could have imagined, including you, Zibby, and this book and this whole new kind of universe that I was not a part of and exploring all these creative sides of my life that I had just sort of put to the side because they weren't strategic and they weren't going to get me to the right place in my career. And it's just been the most extraordinary experience kind of from day one. Oh my gosh. Well, the book itself, you wrote a great essay for what was Moms Don't Have Time to Write back then, or maybe then it was We Found Time. Anyway, now it's Zibby Meg. And I remember reading it and being like, this is so great. And then didn't I reach out and say like, do you You have a book in you or something? (laughs) Like what? And I was like, don't sell it anywhere else. I'm starting a company. (laughs) 
You, that's exactly what happened. Like you reached, I submitted this essay. It was really in like the deep, dark days still of COVID. Like it was still, everybody was still at home. And it was an essay that was based on what is now the fitness section of the book. And you wrote back immediately. First of all, I was like, I couldn't believe you were the one reading the essays for your site. And you wrote me back and you were like, can we get on Zoom? And I was just telling this story this morning to a friend of mine. And I tell it to anybody who would listen, which is that you were so generous with your time. And you just hopped on a call with me and you were like, tell me what you're doing and tell me about yourself and (laughs) let me introduce you to some people. And it was really amazing. And that has been overwhelmingly my experience actually in the book industry with other writers and other people is just this real generosity of spirit and wanting to share. And then, you know, people are like, what's your publishing journey? And I'm like, well, I queried 7 million agents and finally got one. And then I got a two line email from Zibby that said, have you sold your book yet? I'm starting my publishing company. I want to publish your book, which is still like, I don't know, the Cinderella story of the century for me, I think. (laughs) Oh my gosh. No, I am the lucky one. It goes along with this sort of entrepreneurial drive and spirit you have to make a difference, to try new things, to not be afraid. Like this whole venture is what if between both of us. Go back to the internships for a minute. And I have to say, Kenlock Lodge, even though it's the last of your internships, was like laugh out loud funny. The mishaps that happened when you were working at this lodge, the when you went into the wrong room, oh my gosh, just... Talk about each one a little bit and some of the highlights that people will find. Sure. Um, So I started before COVID really kicked off. I left my husband and kids in London and I got on a plane and I went to New York. But to be clear, you did not leave your husband. You just kind of... No, he was still... He was... I temporarily left him. Yeah, (laughs) okay. I temporarily left him. He was going to come meet me after two weeks with the kids. And I had been very generously introduced to two directors, John Doyle and James Lapine, two incredible directors who were in rehearsals for a Broadway and an off-Broadway musical that were going to open in the spring. And so the mandate was like, come and shadow and you can sit in and learn. And of course, immediately I was like, I have to do something and make myself useful. So I started like volunteering to sweep up the floor and filling the water jugs before people would ask me and like actually buying coffees for the cast because no one would ask me to go get them coffee. But I was like, no, no, it's my treat. Let me just go buy all of you coffee because I was so desperate to be useful. And so that was the first one. And I think timing wise, it's not a spoiler to say that uh, I left at the end of February, 2020. So I had to kind of cut that short and come home in the UK, come back to the UK very shortly after. My second internship was with a fitness brand, a retro dance and fitness brand called Retro Glow. And at the very beginning of COVID, they were looking to go virtual. And I begged Frankie Taylor, who's the owner, to let me intern for her, do a virtual internship and sort of help her figure out how she was going to transition to putting her entire business and running it out of her living room and doing it on TV. That involved learning how to use social media in a more meaningful way, which was not natural to me as a child of the 80s, and also trying out all of the competitor classes that she had. So I did retro aerobics from an Australian class. I did a lot of sexy dancing in my living room, which was really, really (laughs) difficult while my kids were running around. I did some gong baths and meditations. I did something called Voga, which was like really weird. I really got my fill of novelty exercise classes during that internship. And it really got me through the real worst parts of like that first lockdown. Uh, My third internship was for a contemporary art dealer in London called Blaine Art, and they sell contemporary painting and sculpture, buy and sell at the very top tier of the market. So I was seeing Hockney's and Picasso's and Frida Kahlo's and these like incredible pieces of art. I very quickly realized that even though I had minored in art history some almost 20 years before, I knew absolutely nothing and remembered nothing. I knew none of the words and none of the artists and none of the terminology. And that was a real lesson in humility and (laughs) learning how to ask questions and kind of exploring this, like I was going to all these galleries all the time, you know, as things were starting to open back up and I had really missed that part of my life. So that was just a joy. And then the final internship, as you refer to, was at Kinloch Lodge. It is a hotel and restaurant on the Isle of Skye in Scotland. And oh my God, I was so, I was just so bad. I was so (laughs) bad at all of it. And I have to say that I've been back subsequently. We go to to Sky a lot. And Isabella, the owner, is a very good friend now, in spite of my terrible internship for her. And like, there have been times, you know, with COVID and Brexit, there's been a lot of staffing issues in the UK, like trying to get people staffed. And I'm always, every time I go, I'm like, 
if you need someone to come and waitress the restaurant shift, I know what I'm doing. Come and call me. And literally no one has ever picked up the phone to call me in spite of the fact that they've like been desperately recruiting staff for six months. They really don't want me to come back there. So understandable. Perhaps my skills are better used elsewhere. But man, anything involving hand-eye coordination, carrying plates, remembering people's room numbers, I was just so bad at it. But I loved every single one and I learned so much from every single one. So what was your final, not to give the ending away, but just after doing all these internships, like what are you taking away from this? What are, how are you inspiring other people? Should they try it? Or could, what is the hack that they could get from just reading your book? I mean, I think, you know, it was a interesting circumstance. Would I recommend that everybody go and take a sabbatical from their job to do internships? No, I don't think it's for everyone. Although if you can make it work, it was a great experience for me, but there was a lot of privilege that I had to be able to do that. You know, a husband that was willing to watch the kids, a job that I was running the company. So I was able to take time off and kind of manage that on my own. But I think the real lessons that came out of it are much more widely applicable. I mean, you know, you, you said, that I, I wasn't I'm doing all these things that um, and I wasn't afraid to do all these things. But actually, like, I'm still terrified all the time to do all of these things. And one of the big differences that's come as a result of this internship project for me is that I do them anyway, even though I am afraid to do them. So it's not at all the absence of fear. It's just trying to push through that and knowing that whatever comes on the other side of it is going to be worth it, even if it's terrible. I went to an acting class the other night. I'm I can't act. Like, I'm a terrible actor. I don't even know how to act. But it was something I'd always wanted to try. So I was like, let me just go to this workshop and see what happens and play zip, zap, boop with all of these other theater kids. And like, why not? Am I going to do an internship in professional acting? No, definitely not. But, you know, I'm so, so glad I did it. So really, the biggest thing for me has been forcing myself to not get too comfortable, to push myself out of my comfort zone, to remember that learning is part of what motivates me to do almost anything. So if I'm going to go into an activity and learn from it, you know, that that's in and of itself a really good goal. And to be okay to not be good at stuff. And that is still, I'm constantly working on that. But to be comfortable with failure, to be comfortable with not being the best, you know, from my entire childhood, that has been very difficult for me to not be, you know, really good at things. And I think I, for a long time, shied away from doing stuff that I wasn't good at naturally because I didn't want to not be the best at it. And now I'm trying to do the opposite. I'm intentionally have to do things that I may not be good at, that I'm not the best at, and be okay with that. And truly, it has made my life so much richer and deeper. Failure has been great for me, actually. I think it's working really well. <laughs> Oh, that is so amazing. Tell listeners about your upcoming tour. You're going to so many places. Oh my God, we're having a party. So, I mean, look, you, I think you approach publishing Zibby from this way of like, here's what's happening and how can we make it better and different? And why does it have to be this way? So I think all of your Zibby books, Stable of Authors, are really like taking that ethos in. I was desperate to go on tour. I have missed seeing people. I love being around people. And like what? I mean, it's like incredible that this book is even coming out. So celebrating it, I really wanted to do. But I started thinking like, what kinds of things would I want to go to? And it's nice, of course, to go hear an author read their book if you like know their book and who they are, but nobody really knows who I am yet. So I was like, how can we actually kind of take the spirit of my what if year and do some really fun, exciting, interesting things? So we have got a wild agenda coming up. We are doing a dance class together in New York. That's right. Yep. Plus a launch at the Strand, which is going to be amazing. We're doing cocktail making also in New York with Tara's. Then I go down to Miami and I've got a family fun day with laser tag and virtual reality and a craft workshop and cookies. I mean, all kinds of things. We'll be in New Orleans the week before Mardi Gras. So we are celebrating there with a Mardi Gras headdress making workshop and mimosas the night before the, the, the morning of the Muses Parade, which is in the evening. And my high school crush is DJing, which is pretty oh much reason gosh. to go on book tour enough in and of itself. We've got a house concert in Houston and then some really fun stuff being planned for LA and Seattle. So I would love to see as many people as possible there. This is like, I'm a, I am an extrovert in the sense that I get my energy from being around other people. So I just cannot wait to do this. I'm like okay. planning all my outfits. This is my big crisis now like, what am I <laughs> on book tour. <laughs> And everyone can find details of your tour on aliciafmiranda.com. 
right? Correct. Yeah. Okay. And we will link to it as well. One thing I just want to talk about for two seconds are your twins, because you seem to manage everything with such grace and I don't know, this great fun loving attitude that I love. <laughs> um, and you referred to parenting as a rush of code switching, which I just think is so perfect. So talk about just your experience with being a mom now of your kids that are older. And I love how you wrote about it in the book and how you were finally willing to sort of come clean about just how hard it was to have twins, which is fellow mom of twins I completely relate to. And just ha- how you're incorporating all that and making it all work. Um, if it looks like I've got it all under control, then I'm doing a great job of promoting that on social media because honestly, uh, it's, it's extremely challenging. I mean, I, I never give people, I hate giving people parenting advice because I'm always like, that's the thing they're going to pull back when your kids are like in rehab one day or something like that. You know, (laughs) I, um, I never want somebody seeing my article about bragging about what a good mom I am. I'm not sure if I would say I have struggled with parenting, but I have found parenting very hard. It's been the biggest challenge of my life. And I think in large part, it's because it's been a thing I can't really control. And I have addressed most of the challenges in my life by trying to control them because that's the type of person I am. And then I had kids and I had a challenging journey to even getting pregnant. And then when I had the twins, you know, I mean, it was, it was so, so difficult. Those early days were really tough for me and I found very little joy in it. I love my children, but I found kind of that initial stage really, really hard. And so I, w- I wished when my kids were little that I had more people that were willing to just be like, yes, having kids is amazing and also having kids is really difficult and let's like embrace it all. I think a lot more people are willing to do that now than they were 11 years ago when my twins were babies. And so I try to be honest with people about what that experience has been. It has not been easy. My kids are coming on book tour with me. They're coming along for the ride. You know, I drag them to all sorts of things. And I am starting to understand as they grow older and develop their own personalities that it's okay where my kids are not like me. My kids are total homebodies. Whereas I would get on a plane, if somebody was like, do you want to meet me in Paris for lunch tomorrow? Which is a short flight for me because I live in Scotland. I'd be like, yeah, let's go. Where do you want to meet? What time and where? Like, I'll be there. Whereas my kids, they really prefer, they like to stay home. They like stability. They like to be in one place. And that is for someone like me who wants to create all these fun adventures from them all the time and go and do this. You know, it's been a constant learning that I can't control who they are. I can't control what they do. So I'm just trying my best every day. I try to role model for them. I try not to get frustrated. I do not always succeed. But I ultimately, I try to be honest when I talk about parenting, the good parts and the challenging parts, because I think I love when other people are honest with me about that. And so I try to pay that forward since my kids are a bit older now. No, it's it's true. I do think there has been a shift with the parenting dialogue that it's totally. okay. And I don't know, I felt, I mean, my twins are 15 and a half, but I felt like there was still so much like, my kids did this at this age and yes, we've already mastered this. And I was always sort of like feeling bad about everything. Mm-hmm. So I'm glad that it's okay to say, yeah, this is really hard and it's okay. And I mean, honestly, I think sites like Moms Don't Have Time to Write, Now Zibby Mags, like places for moms, you know, parents, but but really from my personal experience, mothers, to talk about what they're really going through, what it's really like. I think that has made a really big difference in also there being kind of outlets, places to go and Google and read about not just this very picture perfect, idealized, you know, Instagram filter ready, like version of parenting, but how it can be challenging and how if you're a person with your own identity and your own ambitions and your kind of plan for your life and then you have kids and that changes things and it shifts things and it's not necessarily a negative thing, but it is something that you have to kind of reckon with. And so I think that having outlets like Zibby Mag and like, you know, there's now a lot of different places you can go to read about parenting. I have found reading other people's personal stories incredibly helpful. I still do it now, now that we're entering like pre-adolescence and, you know, the pre-teen years. And that's a totally different phase of parenting. That's nothing like what came before. I am like constantly reading about other mothers of teenagers. Like, tell me, tell me how you did it and how you survived. I want to know everything. So don't worry, Zivi, you're on my list of uh, people to (laughs) hit up for parenting. So many people had terrified me about my kids being completely different people and that the teenage years were going to be like the worst things of my life, like from when they were little. And they probably did this to you, like wait till they're teenagers. But you know what? Teenagers, if you're close to your kids 
it's just the next day. Like it's one day after another. It's like, if you, if you take your eye off the ball, it maybe it's a huge thing, but I don't know. I just, I don't know. I, I, you can, we can handle it. Anything. So Alicia, right, <laughs> it's just, yeah, I, I feel like, I don't know. I think it's all about respecting your kids and yeah. knowing who they are. And, but I, I am no parenting expert either. Okay. So your book is coming out. You're going on this fabulous tour. Tell us what's next. Where do you want your life to go? So my world domination? No. Um, I have some ideas. I am working on a novel. Uh, as someone who's also writing a novel, you will relate to me that that is a challenging process, but I am still enjoying it mostly. You know, but one thing I would say that I, is different now from basically every other stage of my professional life is I'm trying to remain open to different opportunities to seeing where this takes me. The things that have materialized as a result of the internships themselves and then the process of writing the book have taken my life into all of these directions that I never could have expected. I mean, I don't think it's a spoiler to share that while Kinluck Lodge has never once invited me back to waitress, they did ask me to write um, the narrative and a bunch of essays for a cookbook celebrating their 50th year. I mean, never in a million years would I have imagined that I was going to be able to do something like that. And that came as a result of doing this internship and getting to know them a bit better and kind of building that relationship. So I'm trying to see what the universe is going to throw at me. That's very unusual for me because I normally like to plan absolutely everything. But um, I just, I'm already, I've been so delighted with where the different opportunities for my what if year have taken me. And I can't wait to see what's going to happen when it actually comes out. Oh my gosh, me too. Well, for everyone listening, please join Alicia on tour. She'll be everywhere and it'll be really exciting. She'll be popping by so many bookstores for signings and all of that great stuff. Pick up my what if year today and... Yeah, just follow follow along. We're so excited. We're so, so excited. Yeah. It's our joint baby. We're going to parent this baby very well together, Zibi. I have no <laughs> doubt. You're like the parent. I'm like the babysitter on the side. I'm like, you know, or the teachers. I'm like off on the sidelines, you know, just like helping it along. But you're the real, <laughs> you're the real parent here. Anyway, congratulations. I'm so excited. We're going to have so, so much, much fun. Thank you so much Thank for having me. <laughs> Thanks for listening to this episode of Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. Don't forget to follow me on Instagram at Zibby Owens and at Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. Also sign up for my newsletter at ZibbyOwens.com and sign up for my virtual book club and meet lots of authors on Zoom every other week. Thanks so much to Steve and Ryan at Texture Sound for the sound editing. And thank you to Morning Moon Productions for providing this fantastic intro and outro music. 